Welcome back. So today we're talking about working with survivors who have DID. This is part three of our three-part series. A couple caveats. Remember that I'm doing these presentations from two perspectives. One is the perspective of having DID and having gone through an extensive healing process. Um, so that's 25 years of knowing and living with DID. Um, and then the other uh, expertise that I'm bringing to it is as an attorney, an advocate, someone who has been working in the field of gender-based violence since the mid-1990s. So I, what I do is I combine both experiences to come up with suggestions for what might help uh, when you're working with someone with DID. Okay. Um, so let's recap for a second. I'm going to share my screen and pull up the PowerPoint. And let's recap, why do we need to know about DID? So we need to know about DID because it's very likely that you have or will work with survivors who have it. And they will either know they have it or they won't know they have it, but you'll still be working with someone that has DID and um, if you figure that out, there are things that you can do that are really helpful. All right, and you can do this with everyone, by the way. You can do this kind of work um, with everyone that you work with, with all the survivors that you work with, and then you don't have to worry about whether someone is telling you they have it or whether you're thinking about it correctly or not. Um, so why do you need to know? Studies show that in the US, somewhere between one and 3% of the population have DID. And I would argue that it's much larger than that. If you think about what causes DID, it's that someone below the ages of seven, eight, or nine um, experiences ongoing trauma. Um, it might be abuse, it might be neglect. Um, it could be that there's a, a serious illness in the family um, or that a parent is incarcerated. Those kinds of things create trauma and can cause a person a child to dissociate and create imaginary worlds in their head um, and section off. Um, the other reason I want you to know about it is because I want you to help people who have it. Um, without help, DID, um, and especially when there's no uh, communication inside, it can create chaos and risk for people who have it. Um, and people who have it can experience additional challenges in a crisis. And right now we're in a crisis. Um, our, the, the pandemic, the economic collapse, the um, racial justice issues, and then the, uh, basically the political crisis that we're in. So all of this comes together to make it more challenging for people generally, but for people with DID, it can be re-traumatizing and it can create uh, a lack of cohesion inside. So for example, I, uh, went through an extensive healing process and I've been moving through the world as if I was one for about 25 years. And um, this time that we're in is really challenging for me. And at times I've had to pay really close attention inside so that my cohesion and my parts are working together. Um, so, all right. So what you can do. Now, some of these slides you may recognize if you watched video number two, which is about the healing process. And I thought it was important to go ahead and carry them into this slide, into this section, because some people might not feel that they need to know about the healing process, um, but I still want them to know what they can do. So there's three kinds of general areas that I think you can do things. Um, one is you can learn more about the ID. Um, the facts about DID, the impact on people, and the healing process. And there's a number of ways you can do this. There are organizations, you can go to their websites. Um, An Infinite Mind has some good information. The Sidron Foundation, uh, isst-d.org, the International Society for the Study of Trauma and Dissociation. There's another organization called um, Beauty Beyond Bruises, I think is what it's called. And they have some really great information there. And then you can always go to my website, uh, olgatrujillo.com, where I have information on DID. 
You can also um, watch YouTube videos that people have done about DID and their life with DID. Um, there's some really good ones out there. Um, there's a number of really good books that have been written, um, memoirs uh, that have been written by people with DID. I wrote one called The Sum of My Parts, which is also in Spanish. Um, talks about how I developed DID, lived with it, and then the, half the book is on the healing process. The um, Fractured is also a good book um, by Robert Oxnum. Um, and there's a number, a number of more books. There's also workbooks um, that are really helpful to read to kind of get a sense of some of the exercises that you can do with survivors um, that might be in your program. Um, it's a book for clinicians and people with DID, but I think it's got some really helpful stuff in it um, for advocates as well. And so it's called uh, Coping, sorry, it's on my bookshelf, Coping with Trauma-Related Dissociation. And the authors, oh, I can't see it right now. Um, Kathy Steele is one of the authors, S-T-E-E-L-E. -E -E. Um, so you can look that up on Amazon or wherever you get your books. And um, I think that one's particularly good. And there's a number of other books out there. Um, and then learning about the healing process. If you're a clinician, the book that the psychiatrist I worked with wrote, Dr. Richard Sheffitz, um, Working with Dissociative Processes, The Fear of Feeling Real. That's a really great book um, about the healing process. Um, so those are some ways in which you can learn. The other thing that you can do is when you're working with someone who has DID is ask them about their experience. What helps? What's hard? What challenges do they have? Um, how does their DID show up in everyday life? How do they manage it? Um, and how can you help them? Uh, what's helpful and what's not helpful? What are things that you just should not do? Um, so those kinds of conversations are super, super helpful um, as long as people know that they have it. Um, okay, so then what I want you to do as you build this knowledge is I want you to share it with colleagues and others. It's really important for people to know about DID before a survivor um, tells them that they have it. Um, in, the, in law enforcement, prosecution, medical practice. Because the problem is, is DID as a diagnosis, as a mental health disorder, as an, a creative adaptive um, coping mechanism, there's cynicism about it um, because, because of you know, the, the undermining of the disorder in the, the past 30 years. So um, people are more likely to connect with someone who has DID if they've, if they've learned about it beforehand. If the way they learn about it is because someone tells them they have DID, the likelihood that they won't handle that well is higher. So if you have, if you're part of a SANE team or a SART team, if you're part of a CCR, um, your colleagues at your program, um, the medical people at the hospital or clinics, um, people who you work with outside your organization, if you could give them information about DID, show them these videos, show them my website if you want, um, anything that would help give them a little bit more information, I think it would really help when survivors come to them and identify that they have DID. Now, they, the survivors may not know they have DID, and if they, those people know they have DID, they might see signs of it, which then they can adapt the way they work with people. Um, so I think that would be really helpful for everyone involved if you're able to do that. And then finally, when you're working with people with DID, to help them to know what to expect and to be proactive. And I'll kind of walk through this. Um, so um, for mental health practitioners, and I know I mentioned this in video two, I just wanna mention it again in case people haven't watched it. When you're working with someone, listen carefully for things that might indicate that someone has DID. What people tend to do is when they talk about voices in their heads or thoughts, racing thoughts, um, they'll go to schizophrenia first 
um, rather than kind of continuing to listen and hearing about trauma, gaps in their childhood memory, um, seeing signs of dissociation, um, panic attacks, those kinds of things, those all kind of come together as a possibility of DID. But because some of the symptoms connect with other stuff, because when people have parts, they behave very differently from one part to the other, um, people are diagnosed with other things that aren't really helpful. Um, those misdiagnoses delays a person's ability to get a handle on their DID and to have collaboration inside. So consider that DID might be a possibility for survivors. Um, make sure if you're not a clinician or if you're a clinician that doesn't work with people with DID, make sure that you know who in your area does work with people with DID and reach out and connect with them so that if you need to refer someone to them, um, that you know that they work on DID and how they do it, and also that they have room in their schedule for it. Um, and then if you wanna become a clinician that works with people with DID, the International Society for the Study of Trauma and Dissociation um, does trainings um, across the country and across the world actually, and they're doing a lot virtually right now. Um, and there are pe there's ways to work with some of the clinicians there um, that are part of that group um, to get supervision for your work. Okay, and if you're looking for someone who works with people, a clinician who works with people with dissociative identity disorder, what you wanna look for are people that say that they work with trauma and dissociation. Um, it's the dissociation part that is, um, shows you kind of a difference of how someone is working with people with trauma. Meaning, so I mentioned yesterday that well, the way that you treat um, DID is different from how you would treat PTSD. And in fact, the way you would treat PTSD might make someone with DID um, struggle more. Um, so, so you wanna make sure the person does know DID or dissociation. All right. So we talked about learning about the healing process and um, video number two talks extensively about the process that I went through healing, which is um, consistent with the ISSTD guidelines. But let me tell you a little bit about it. So people with DID generally are unresponsive and may deteriorate under standard treatments of cognitive behavior therapy and exposure therapy for PTSD. So that's why you don't wanna just send someone who with DID to someone who just does, does trauma. Um, because what someone with DID does needs is a phase oriented treatment um, that involves three different stages. So the first stage is creating safety and stabilization, which is what advocates do all the time, right? You get people that are in crisis and you help, help them find physical and emotional safety and then stabilizing them, helping them figure out what they need to do next and how they can do it. Um, the next stage involves the trauma processing and then also containment. Um, because as they're doing this processing work, you don't want it to spill over in other aspects of their lives. And this is not what advocates do. This is more along the lines of what clinicians would be doing. And then, so that, so that first stage is safety and stability. The second stage is trauma processing. And then there's this last stage, which is the integration of the experiences that someone has separated out. So not getting rid of parts, but so someone can feel that the things that they created parts for to escape happened to them. Once someone is able to do that, once they've integrated the experiences, then they won't be controlled by those experiences when they're triggered. Um, so that's why that's important. Um, so once someone has done that, then there's a phase, um, a process of learning how to live with what you know about your life. The fact that you were abused, the fact that, and like, so for me, I was abused by my family. I had to learn how to live with the knowledge that my family wasn't really a family for me. So there's a lot to that. Um, okay, so let's talk about some of the advocacy skills that you have. 
Um, and so how do you do safety planning with someone with DID? So first, remember, you're having a conversation with someone to figure out how they move through the world, okay? And then that's how you build in the safety planning. So you learn how they go from one thing to the other, what happens when they switch, things like that. This is if they know they have DID. So some, some common general rules for working with safety planning is to repeat things as often as needed. Um, person might come to you a few times not remembering that they talked to you because it was different parts of them. Um, so you wanna repeat things as often as they come to you. And you wanna keep it simple. You also wanna talk about dissociation with them and plan for what happens when they dissociate. Also talk about what happens when they switch. And can, so if it's someone who knows that they have DID, talk about center the DID in your safety planning. How does this information get shared with other parts? How do you make sure who's gonna call who in, in your little um, flow chart of how they do their, how they um, keep themselves physically safe? Um, talk about how uh, all everyone inside needs to work together. Again, this is only going to work if the person knows they have DID or knows they have parts. So don't talk to someone about having parts or having DID who doesn't already know it. Um, because that's not your job. But really what your job is in that situation, if you suspect someone has DID, your job in that situation is to give them things in different forms of learning so that they remember it. So repeating things, keeping it simple. Uh, you can talk about dissociation because you're gonna see somebody doing it, whether they recognize that they're doing it or not. So you can, you can, you can kind of hone in on what that is and when that happens. And that's a really good conversation, but don't talk about parts if they haven't talked to you about parts. And remember that if you work with people the same way over and over again, that's the way that people will work with you. That's what they'll do. They'll think about it that way. They'll work it that way because that's, that's the brain kind of rewiring to think about things that way. And that's because of neuroplasticity. So if you constantly go through the same things with someone, eventually that's what they're going to do. So let's talk about accessing services. Um, shelter is one of the biggest services that people try to access, people with DID try to access, that's very hard. And um, there are things that you can do to make it a little easier for people. Uh, one is these are the things that are really hard for people. So sharing a room with someone they don't know, not being able to lock their door. Uh, people have a really hard time sleeping at night. In fact, some people don't sleep in their bedrooms at all. They sleep in the living room on the couch or in a chair. Um, people will withdraw. Um, they'll kind of like pull back and won't get a sense. You won't get a sense of them. Um, if around chaos, around um, communal living type situations. So what you can do is, is try to create flexibility in your programs that would enable someone to stay in a room that is just theirs, to be able to lock the door, to be able to lock the bathroom door, um, and enable people to have their lights on at night, um, if it's possible to let people sleep out in common areas at night, um, that would be really helpful for folks. There are some people that won't sleep at night at all. They'll sleep during the day. Um, if it's possible to let someone have a television on in their room at night, that would be really helpful for folks or let them listen to um, podcasts or music or whatever it is that um, might help them. Uh, calm the noise in their head. Um, that's really kind of what's hard for folks is that there's so much going on in somebody's head, that voices and thoughts and white noise that it's hard to concentrate, it's hard to relax. Um, so one thing that I always did um, was watching TV would help me to kind of um, rest in my mind so I wouldn't be listening to the voices so much or uh, listening to podcasts or music. Um, any kinds of things like that are really helpful. 
And then teaching people about grounding techniques. And um, I know a lot of shelters have grounding rooms or um, prayer rooms or you know quiet areas, meditation rooms. So that can be really helpful. Um, meditation is a really hard thing for people with um, DID because of all the noise in your head or voices. Um, so grounding techniques of getting them to focus on their hands, uh, how their hands feel up against a chair or their feet on the floor, those kinds of things are really helpful to keep them here and today. But, but again, recognizing that not everyone is going to be able to, um, to fit in a shelter environment. So to try to adapt your environment to make it possible for folks with DAD to be able to access those services. Um, and then helping clients be proactive. So helping them learn uh, what to expect and to plan. So I have a couple ideas around this and this is just the beginning of a conversation. So this is a conversation that you can have with survivors that you work with, but here we go. So first is have them plan for a crisis and plan for re-traumatization. So discuss this with them and a plan. You can use COVID-19 as a really good example right now. What would happen if they get COVID-19 or if their partner or a close supportive uh, person gets the virus? Um, you can also develop, and I've got copies of these, not exactly this language, but a little bit different. You can develop a DID emergency information card that they can keep with them at all times. And then if they end up in the hospital or if they're in a, um, a substance abuse program or law enforcement uh, picked up by the police for some reason, um, they can give this card to them. And it really helps if it has your logo on it. Um, but to can give this card so the person can see that they have dissociative identity disorder, it gives them a little bit of guidance on how to work with them, like how to refer to them, um, who to call in an emergency. Um, so all of that can be really helpful. So talk this possibility through with the survivor that you're working with. And of course, they have to know they have DID in order for you to have this conversation with them. Um, and then part of this conversation is who do they want involved to help them? Should there be an emergency? And create a card similar to this one. Um, and again, if it has your organization's logo on it, it will help to um, give it credibility. And I have cards with language on them that you can have and you can, um, I have the PDF you can have and you can change it according to what the survivor needs or wants. Um, and you can email me for those. And my email is olgatrujillo.com. Uh, Olga at olgatrujillo.com, sorry. <laughs> okay, so helping them move through the world. Um, and the way that you can help them think about how they move through the world is help them plan ahead. Now, you're going to do this as well. So anything that you need them to do, so let's say you're helping them through a system process, let's say a court process, okay, because a lot of survivors are in legal proceedings. And so planning ahead of time is significantly important. It's vital for people. Making things as predictable as possible is also really important. So, so really, really think through from the point of time when they leave wherever they're at to get to wherever they're going, what are the steps that they're gonna need to take? Are they gonna take a bus? Are they gonna drive? Are they gonna take a Metro? What? And then where do they get off? Where do they enter the building? What are they gonna encounter when they get into the building? What, where do they go? Do they go upstairs or elevators? You have to go through this whole step-by-step -step process and if possible, practice it before the event. Um, so if they're gonna testify in a court case, for example, you wanna go through all this and then practice with them. And I, and I mean right now, practice with them if it's gonna be a Zoom court or if it's gonna be in person, then practice with mask, with social distancing and with care 
that they can go through the motions of what they need to go through. So when they're doing it on the day that may be really anxiety producing, that they're gonna be able to do it. The other thing is to limit stimulation as much as possible. So it's hard when you live in a communal setting like a domestic violence shelter to limit um, stimulation. And that's why having their own room might be really helpful. Um, but when you've experienced trauma, and especially when you have DID, all the things around you, you're constantly taking all that in and assessing for safety. It's, it's a natural thing that you do because it's what you had to do growing up. So if there's a lot going on around you, then it can become exhausting to constantly be taking that in. So the more that you can limit stimulation, noise, um, chaos or, or activity, um, um, making sure that where you're meeting with people is fairly quiet, not too closed in, but comfortable. Um, so things like that can be helpful to take a look at your office space. Um, if you're meeting with people electronically, virtually, then considering what is their situation like and where they are, can they speak freely or not? Um, and then so where, how can you create a situation where you can meet with them and where they have less stimulation going on? Um, you can do this. A lot of people in rural areas are meeting people in parking lots and talking on the phone. So they're in their car and the advocates in their car and they're talking to each other via the phone, but they can see each other. They're in, each, they're in their own cars. The other thing is um, give people information in different modes of communication. This is super helpful because you can't take it all in um, when you're meeting with someone, um, especially when you have all that going on in your head. And also different parts uh, might not be able to understand everything that you're telling them. So if you can give people things in, in drawings or graphic uh, uh, fotonovelas is how kind of we refer to them in Latino programs, um, graphic novels, if you can give them things that are drawn out. Um, in doctor's offices, you know, they have models of the skeleton or the body, the part of the body you're talking about, and they show you on that, and then they give you something in writing, and then they talk to you about it. So if you could do um, video recordings of things, um, <clears throat> graphic novels, and then discussion, and if you can walk someone through it, then you're likely for that person to really fully understand it, but they may come back again and ask you again and just be willing to do that. Um, and then talk about trauma related issues and how you'll handle them. So when people know they have DID, it's a much easier conversation. But if they don't know they have DID, you don't have to talk to them as if they have DID. You can talk to them about trauma itself, that these the kinds of things that they've gone through causes trauma, that kind of trauma can make it difficult for people to then come up, you know, do some of the things that they need to do or that they wanna do to be able to um, address the issue. And so let's talk about what happens to you when that happens so I can help you deal with those things. Um, so it's what make what can trigger them, what happens when they get triggered, and what kinds of grounding techniques do they know. Okay, so a word about legal proceedings. Legal proceedings are inherently triggering. They're adversarial. Um, and that is by nature gonna trigger someone that has experienced trauma. So expect that that person's gonna have a trigger. So again, prepare ahead of time, make things as predictable as possible and have a conversation about what happens when they get triggered so that you have a plan for how to address it when it happens. Um, also, you may wanna explore video testimony um, based on the level of trauma that that person may have experienced. And this would be the kind of conversation that you would have with um, the lawyers involved and the court personnel. So what else can you do? There's a few different ideas. Again, planning for triggers is really important. Um, encouraging supportive connections. So remember the thing that 
um, in video two that I talked about that made Rich's approach to healing so different than other people's was that he built connections throughout all the phases. And so that when I was, when I went through the level of trauma that I needed to go through um, and reintegrate those experiences, that I could leave therapy and not have to keep going back. Um, because I had people in my life that were supportive of me and where I felt safe. So encouraging supportive connections and helping to make connections are really important. Culturally specific programs or communities in your area might be really helpful for this. Um, and then uh, other kinds of activity support groups are really good. Um, peer support networks are really helpful. So think about who is in this person's life that you can help them um, build a supportive connection with. And if they don't have people in their life, um, explore interests and identity so that, that you might come up with ideas for how they can develop connections. Um, consider support animals or service animals um, in your program or for the person who um, has DID that you're working with, who really, really helpful for people. And then learn about grounding techniques and practice them ahead of time. I'm sure you know a lot of grounding techniques. Um, one really common one is getting someone to feel their body in the room. So if, so if they're sitting down, feel their feet on the floor, feel their legs on the chair, their arms on the chair, that kind of thing. And then ask them to identify how many blue items, how many round items, you know, that kind of thing that brings them back in the room. And then ask them what day and where they are so that you have a sense that they are really back there. So practice those first with um, colleagues before you practice those, before you use those if you're new to them. All right, so here's the deal. DID is a superpower and the people that you work with that have it are superheroes, seriously. It is incredible that someone could create parts to escape something that they couldn't physically escape. If you look at folks from that perspective, you will support who they are from a strength-based perspective. It is incredibly important to do. When we've been abused and when our brains are different, our focus can be really, really negative on ourselves. And it's really helpful to have someone that can see the strengths in who we are. Um, so if you can do this, it'd be really, really helpful. All right. So these are some of the resources that I've talked about. Um, and there's lots more. And again, this is my website um, where you can find some information. And my email address is olga at olgatrahio.com. Thank you so much. And I hope to see you during the question and answer session.